Okay, let's bring Addie in and get her done. Hey. Yay! What's up, Appreciate man? How's it, how's it going? Good, good. Um, congratulations on your first DKE con online. This is wonderful. Th thank you, I think. You think? It's going well, good? Yeah, it's always great, but um, I've somehow made of this rule that we have to like be here for three days yep. and it is uh i don't know we'll see i'm already just kind of like falling off my chair i still have another eight hours of it tomorrow so we'll see the bags in the studio there you know it's, the uh, i look back on it fondly but i'm not really a process person so I find the process uh, sort of daunting but let's not talk about me we're here to talk about you So for all the people who don't know who you are, could you introduce yourself? Yep, I'm 80. Um, I create the False Idols, which are all based on characters that I've been very fond of growing up, generally speaking, but obviously that shifts into pop cultural genres that are now uh, more prevalent also. Um, I've been working on these for probably about four years. I've sh I shift a lot in my artwork. I began as a street artist back in the early 80s in Melbourne, Australia, and have kind of shifted through many things. I was a fine art oil painter at one stage as well, and I went back to doing a lot of street art, sort of paste up inspired, installation inspired stuff, and everything just kind of feeds into the next thing. And I was designing these totemic type figures um, and looking at them and thinking, how do you make these into 3D? and tried a heap of different uh, mediums and nothing was working. And I'm terrible with woodwork and all that type of stuff. And I thought, I'll just take it on and give it a shot. So I, I began making them everything by hand. So they were all a bit crazy and trying to saw little pieces, you know, the little circles and stuff and get everything perfect. It was quite tricky. But as time went on, um, I discovered things like laser cutting and I've got a bit of a design background as well. So I just started building things and really getting them into a much neater format and then it kind of just took hold and they moved from these characters that I was designing myself into the pop cultural artifacts, you could say, um, which is what they are today. You know, and obviously all heavily inspired by when I grew up, I was, you know, totally obsessed with Star Wars. I can still remember, I think I was about five, seeing the ad on television. Um, and I can remember Leia and Luke swinging across the inside the Death Star there. Um, and just being like, oh, my God, my mum took me to the drive-in um, back then. I don't know, you'd have drive-ins over there, I'm assuming, or had drive-ins. Um, we, had, we had, I mean, there are still some left. Um, they've made a comeback during pandemic. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. It's nice social distancing, hey, in each vehicle. <laughs> 1.5. Um, so, yeah, so that was all heavily inspired. I used to, I was like, totally obsessed when I was really little as well with there was a segment on at about 6am called King Leonardo Lion it had a whole series of different cartoons like Fearless Fly for instance and Touche Turtle and and so a lot of those characters kind of come back from there the beginning of them especially where all those things were like really important to me as a as a child, I did a show back in I think it was 2018 which was the first show based on the false idols and I actually set up my set up a bed, a little single bed. And ironically, I said to my mum, you wouldn't happen to have the, the bed quilt cover that I used to have when I was a kid. And she'd kept it and filed away because it had like these little, um, what were they? They were like little knotty characters on it with trains and stuff. And she actually had it. So I set up my bed like it was and built all these plinths around. So it was kind of like the shrine of all these, you know, idols watching over me in my sleep as a child, which was kind of cool. Um, and yeah, and it just sort of took off from there. I stupid crap gave me a bit of a break back here uh, years ago as well. That was probably back in oh, 2016, 17. And I was working in a studio with Ben Frost and we used to hang out a bit together and he loved it. And he was part owner of stupid crap back then. It's now just Aaron Craig is running that. Um, and they gave me a break and they just, they were just selling. We were putting them online. They were selling within minutes. Um, and it just kind of took off from there. And I just started dropping other things and just completely focusing on the, the false idols. And now it's kind of unintentionally taken over my entire practice, which is a good thing, you know? <laughs> wow. 
<laughs> um, so, so you pronounce your name eighty. Eighty, yeah, eighty. Adrian, my name's Adrian Briley. Um, eighty. Now, so, so, so eighty. Everyone calls me eighty. Eighty. So, but, so I'm mispronouncing your name this whole time when I'm saying Addy. That's fine. That's fine. It's interesting it, that um, Ninja Turtle you just brought up. Then, back in back in the day, I wagged school one day. And this was probably, I don't know, 87 or something, 88, 1988. Um, and we wagged school. I'm not saying that's a good thing to do, obviously, but we went into the city and we have a store in Melbourne. Um, now God, what's the name of it now? Uh, anyway, they have all pop cultural um, genre, heaps of comics. In Melbourne back in the day, there was hardly anything. We couldn't get anything over here. We only had like a couple of record shops that sold hip hop. There was only this one shop. Oh, God, I'm trying. Minotaur, Minotaur Bookshops. Um, and we went in there and I, I found a copy of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and it was a very early copy I'm assuming for back in that time and I bought it and I did a piece with a couple of other guys called Dicing with Death that was quite well known because it was a wild style sort of piece and pretty pretty contemporary for the time back here and I did a huge Ninja Turtle character and that was probably the first time it was ever introduced into Melbourne because it wasn't really known back then obviously they've taken off so much more in the, the coming years but yeah, so it was interesting when we were discussing the Ninja Turtles. I was like, ah, yes. That's not the, the image that I guess I had of Australia. Like, it, it, You make it sound like so like backwater, like you couldn't get yeah, hip-hop albums? This was back in the 80s, yeah. We had, we had like one record shop, Missing Link. There was another one which was more of a commercial one. I forgot what that was called now. Um, they had two stores, one in the CBD and one in one of the suburbs, and that was about it then. And you could literally go in there and there was like 30 or 40 albums and that was it. So every week I'd go in and buy, or probably every second week then, because I was working and it was I earned practically no money. Uh, and they were about $22 an album, which Jeez. was a hell of a lot of money back then. And mm -hmm. I'd buy one album and we'd all go back to my place. There was a couple of friends who were interested in that as well. Because that whole scene was pretty small in in Melbourne back in those days and it was you know graffiti was just considered a complete insult to society and was hated totally of course which I suppose it was everywhere initially um, right <laughs> yeah I, I watched the that Anthony Lister documentary and I mean his current issues notwithstanding but he uh they really went after him pretty hard for you know painting stuff that didn't even look necessarily like graffiti but it was you know almost like fine art in the street and they were you know and he was he was really well known then as well you know he right. was you know young boy punk running around just tagging on stuff he was you know out there doing you know gallery gallery set already and doing great work and being paid to do a lot of these you know murals as well um, and they still yeah totally went for him right a lot of that money just went up his nose <laughs> <laughs> oh, we too much about that, should we? <laughs> oh man. Uh, so, so a lot of with my false idols, I'll just spin around here. I've always been really fascinated with um, ancient artifacts and the idea of ancient artifacts being representations of you know the lifestyle to you know for the gods to give us water and food and well-being I suppose and, um, I happened to go over to the states for the first time a few years back and it was always been my dream to go to Arizona to the Hopi Indian reservations because I collect these little kachinas which are damn expensive too but they're absolutely beautiful I've got probably only got about 15 of them or so um, and I got to go there but I was very heavily inspired by these ancient um, artifacts, even like Egyptian shabdis and that type of thing, or, you know, South American idols. And, and I figured that when it all came to me, with the false idols, it was like, since moving into this, um, you know, post-World War II, probably in this real consumerist market, that we've shifted from that earth sense of idolisation to a consumerist sense. And so I thought, well, using the timber, you know, what, what better way to represent them with, you know, touching on those old, you know, um, old deities and using timber. And that's one of the reasons why I use timber. 
because it has all those flaws in it as well, which I, I leave certain aspects of the flaws in it because I think it just gives it that real look, not that so much manufactured factory look. Um, and so that was heavily involved in the way they look like they do on a simplified form. And then, of course, taking on the whole marketing aspect and branding and trying to sort of reduce the figures into something very recognisable but really quite simple. Um, like the, you know, one of my favourite that you've got there at the moment is the walrus man, just because of the simplicity of it. I think that that's mm -hmm. just a, like a beautiful little figure just with the three colour. I think it's three colourways there and, and just his little blubber mouth type, whatever you'd call that thing, and, and just the eye, I think. Often sure. when they're really, really reduced, they're, they're really quite beautiful. Yeah, I think, how did we meet? I think I first contacted you about making all four of the cantina aliens. Correct, yes. Yeah. And there is, I mean, it's yeah, just reduced is. down to its basic elements, but yet, you know, we just like played this game when we had these on Toy Geeks. I would just hold them up and it, see how quickly people could just respond and name what the character was. And, you know, as long as there was a cultural reference point, like it just, boom, you know, it recognizes it immediately. Um, yeah, it's interesting what you were saying about like what we idolize in in our culture now. When I was younger, someone told me that I mean it was an older man um, you know, telling me that, oh, like religion will go away and eventually people will pray to like Marilyn Monroe and James Dean and Elvis. And I didn't believe him, but I'm starting to think that that is maybe not necessarily those people but that seems like the way we're headed um yeah completely and i think wasn't it australia that that did that census and had like a, a phenomenal jedi. percentage of the people like <laughs> respond that their religion was jedi <laughs> totally, totally um i actually did that and my boss at the time back then <laughs> so we were part of those you know buffoons. Well, well there you go <laughs> wow so is so this is you said you were doing other art before. Yes. Uh, well, let, let's go back even farther. Let's talk about like, were you always creative as a child? Yeah, from from as far as I can remember, I used to draw. I used to draw. Mm -hmm. And then when we saw, I was back in probably grade five when we caught a glimpse of some film clips from over in the States, uh, Buffalo Girls. Mm -hmm. um, and there was graph and stuff in that. And it kind of launched this really, really small, um, you know, group of us from different suburbs who got into breakdancing, really. And obviously, you had your name. Um, I was style master back then, which was kind of... <laughs> <laughs> It, wow. SM, you know with the we, we copied completely the whole american street name things my house number was 50 so it's yeah sm50 and <laughs> you know, there was gs38 and all that stuff and you know kid flip and it was all sort of done around that breaking and then there was a couple there was a few little crews who started taking off doing some really good work straight you know straight art work or graffiti and and i just saw that and it was just like oh my god this is just the best thing of all time so next thing we were um, it was very easy back then in Melbourne to still do trains, but the biggest problem we had was as soon as you do a train, for instance, it would go straight to the buff yard, it would literally leave the yards, so they'd take it into the city and take it offline. So it would do one trip. So we could you could spend all night in the yards, but mm -hmm. they would just never run. So we were like, paint was harder to come by because it was a small town, so to speak, mm -hmm. especially compared to the States. It was hard to get paint. The paint quality was terrible here. We had these brands like Jewel Lux and British Paints that were just shocking really weird nozzles that sprayed either really thin one way or thick the other way and uh, <laughs> just yeah Tara we someone came up eventually with people were putting like bits of cardboard under the nozzles to try and get to spray more evenly and <laughs> what we call it hand control it was just absurd but once you got good at it you know you could actually do really clean outlines and stuff and and sort wow. of cleaned up but yeah it was it was funny back in those days it was I, I wish i had have done more trains than i did actually but like i said they just didn't run so we all did walls because the right. walls last at least so yeah the so trains like, like, trains sounded kind of like a waste of time like they just if they clean them that fast like i mean people you know i don't know like in the united states like there's these you know i've seen the documentaries there's these guys that just want to hit as many train cars as they can and they just sit there for hours and days watching and it's like boom 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 yeah. boom you know it's like 
I forgot that one guy's name. His, his goal was to just hit every train car, like, you know, ever in the world. <laughs> it's yeah, cr- crazy. Cat or someone yeah. Like that, I suppose. We had guys like that here who all they did was just throw ups on the trains. They didn't even do pieces. They were just hitting train yards, you know, and just doing the whole train throw up after throw up after throw up and stuff and just spending their life tagging and, you know, just not going to school. And the scene was kind of um, here. There was a lot of, a lot of people with bad backgrounds really who were just loose on the streets and it was kind of very rough and you know that type of thing it wasn't the nicest but I sort of hung around in that for about 10 years and I started I never really did all the you know there's a heavy heavy focus here on all the Vaughan Boat A characters and stuff but I never really painted any of those I was more interested in artists like surreal art so I'd often do you know there was this guy I came across a book Patrick Woodruff Patrick Woodruff who was an English artist who did this beautiful surreal stuff he'd paint little elephants in snail shells and so I started doing characters like that in my pieces and sort of more artistic so to speak rather than the graffiti style characters and it just went from there and then I just started painting canvases that were kind of comical graph style and then I moved into doing more graph I did like this whole series of intergalactic they called it intergalactic alchemy, which was just filled with spray paint and like universal, um, you know, galaxies forming and stuff. And, and it kind of just kept shifting and shifting. And all of a sudden I was painting native animals, native Australian animals in fine art. Wow. Which was a big, a huge shift, um, of course. But I, had a, I have a huge interest in the environment and stuff. So a lot of those were focused on consumer consumerism again so i'd paint like a, a honey possum which is a small um mammal here in australia on top of a coke can um and have that reference but I, I did that for many years and people were literally buying them because of the product in there and so mm-hmm. then i was getting really pissed off with that because it was like you're not recognizing what i'm trying to say you know being an artist because of the product meaning the coke inside the can exactly or you know i'd have an ipod there with a little mammal sitting on top of it and and so then i started painting dead animals um and taxiderm <laughs> speaking and then that did not go as well then so it kind of <laughs> fizzed off a little bit i was like you know what stuff it i'm not painting them anymore i still get occasionally people contacting me i did do one commission for a guy recently i hadn't painted for about five years and it was quite tricky getting back on the oil paints but i, I just did a he had bought a, a mammal on a coke can and Long story, I wanted to go into it. But anyway, I was like, it was a heartfelt story. And he said, um, I need another one done because my wife's taking that one. I, I want one still. And so I painted him one. He came down from Sydney and not long ago and had a look at it and took it back home. And, but I don't do them anymore. Um, I've only kept probably about four or five of them, which I keep for myself. They're in my own collection. Um, and the so rest when, of them sold. So just so I understand, you mean you would paint something on a Coke can and then someone would buy it and then open the can and drink it? No, no, it would be a painting of an animal sitting on a Coke can. Of an um, animal uh, sitting on a Coke can. Got yeah, it. Okay. Phew. Picture of one. Just, Hang on one start, tick. I'm just going to look at my drawer. Started to sweat there. Look at all those idols on his shelf. I thought I had some little tickets left over. Oh, hang on. Here we go. I've got one print. Can you see that? Oh, uh, I see. Things like that. And so, what, so tell me again, I, I guess I didn't catch that. So you said people were buying them, but they weren't buying them for? For the environmental purpose, I felt. They were buying them because the, depending on the product was in them. You know, we, we've got a thing called like Vegemite in Australia, which. Oh, because they're like fans of Coke and they yeah, buy totally. the Coke. They were buying the pop culture, of course. Mm-hmm. In right. You know? So you're making a statement about the environment. and They're just celebrating the plastic or the, yeah. I get it. Yeah. So how do you feel about then making, you know, pop culture pieces? Well, um, like I said, there's that reference. I think it's important as well, because when you look at where we are now, like as a species, this is mm-hmm. to not sort of record this in a sense. These are the idols of today. You know, I have had some feedback where people think that because I call them false idols, they get a bit frustrated and saying, well, you're putting down that character but it's, it's nothing to do with that it's just more so the false represents our idolization of something that really doesn't actually give us anything back it gives us joy i suppose so but it's it it's it's still there's still a political comment here yeah completely and it's a it's comment not, it's not about the character itself it's about the culture that is 
exactly yeah so celebrating these characters what would you rather they celebrate um I'm not a person to try and <laughs> tell people what to do so I'm happy for them to celebrate anything but I think there's also like there's a deep purpose of nostalgia like as humans we have a you know there's something about nostalgia and having those memories that bring joy to us I sure suppose. but but i mean if if it's a false idol i'm just thinking out loud here if it's a false idol so what is does that mean in your mind that there's an idol that is okay or well is yeah it... going back to these you know say like the hopi indian idols you know they represented something for their well-being you know for the season to be good or you know or the health of their child all these idols represented certain things that were really important to our well-being as a species so Whereas this is all that so this so this is the same as the coke can it is it's, really in a way it, it has the same foundation because because the play off the kachina doll is still the in reference to that you're still talking about nature versus you know the fake things that we make in society and same theme it is really it is yeah. a little a different twist on it i suppose sure but i think there's good to have a purpose to something as well and have some kind of you know something behind what you're doing rather than just making them because i love them for instance absolutely but so what do you think of someone who contacts you and is not thinking about the idolization of pop culture instead of nature and wants to buy it because it's star wars and because they collect cantina aliens yeah, stuff because that's exactly right this is what we idolize they're buying a contemporary modernist but, idol from our era right but does that put me in the same category as like the asshole who liked the coke can and not the bird no well i i, I, <laughs> I, I never call them assholes you're not allowed to put words into my mouth, my mouth. <laughs> everyone will unfollow me and i won't be able to sell anything again. <laughs> no the, you know these are so important to me because they were my upbringing this is you mm. know i've been brought up like all of us who are into this and this was everything to me i just absolutely right. thought it you know i'd be drawing mickey mouse or whatever it may be on bits of paper and you know drawing all types of strange creatures like that and characters and making up my own characters and it is right. it's where we've gone i think it's so important to i think have something out there that represents this of this era because you know the art world shifted so much when when you look at where we are now with art it's just and it's becoming very um, design focused as well. A lot of the artwork where, you know, I remember years ago, artists would be like, well, designers are, you know, they're not artists, which is nonsense. You know, everything, right. essentially well, everything, everything we do is creation. A thought is creation. Um, but it I has mean, shifted so yeah. much you know, and shifted I mean, of course, into production of characters right. as well. You know? I mean, but back, back then they didn't even call yeah. illustration art. Norm, Norman Norman Rockwell was not an artist, you know, he was an illustrator. Yeah. Tell that to the people who are paying millions of dollars for Norman Rockwell originals. Completely. It's funny yeah, how that's... There'd be a lot of artists there who would be thinking, damn, I missed this. I could have made a bloody fortune now with, you know, how things are going. Right. Amazing. So it's more... So you're, you're in the criticism of the culture, you're including yourself. Absolutely. Yes. I am. I am part of the same thing. But is it? But, but I wouldn't it, call it criticism. I'd call it a comment. A comment, right. Um, but, but is it, is it bad? Because when, when I see the painting of the bird on the can, I see, you know, consumerism and, and waste and garbage and a juxtaposition of nature versus just the way we just like throw things out and it's disposable like um but i'm not necessarily asking about the art but are these new idols are they bad like are, is there is there something else that we should be idolizing i mean obviously you know, manufactured needs and wants, like that's, 
you know, that's one argument, you know, conspicuous consumption, that, that kind of stuff, you know, but I mean, what, what else should we be idolizing, I guess? Well, I suppose in essence, we probably shouldn't idolize anything, should we really? Uh <laughs> Ian just yelled, <laughs> just just yelled out Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Thanks, Ian. <laughs> well, wow. there's, still plenty, there's still plenty of people around idolizing Jesus, isn't there? So, no, no right. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> wow. I don't. I don't know where to go from there. Um, yeah. I. I guess I always. I think about the stuff that I collect and I love it and it, it makes me happy and the pursuit of it is fun. Yeah. Um, and when I look at it all together in context, it has meaning for me. It has, you know, it references my childhood and the things that influenced me. But when I look at it next to I guess sometimes I feel bad because, you know, you go to the museum and you see this other kind of art where someone has just drawn this beautiful landscape or whatever they've drawn. And it's like, and I just feel a little bit like a weirdo, like, oh, I collect Star Wars art. <laughs> <Don't> <laughs> I do too. I've got, you know, I've, got so I've got all, so yeah, the top there, are you getting that on the screen? But I've got oh, all what my is that? stuff up are there. You, yeah, but that, when I compare like a piece of Star Wars art on the wall to you know, this other, what, what, you know, I guess they call like fine art <laughs> or yeah. e even the stuff that we're selling today where, you know, these artists are making these, these figures and this is their chosen medium. Um, and I'm a big proponent of this, but it, I still do question, you know, where it comes from. And I, I mean, I like this, quote unquote bootleg scene because it is a criticism also of the mass consumerism it is turning the plastic thing that was meant to be a commodity or a toy um, that is now created for the purpose of being a collectible and then this is going against that a little bit in in that it is now this is the medium by which people have chosen and you're and you're a part of that, obviously. Like, you know, you're, you know, you're appropriating pop culture as well. But I guess I just still have a little bit of that vestigial kind of criticism from you know being in, you know, art history class or that kind of stuff of like what that older definition of art is. Like, you know, that if you're not sitting on top of a mountain painting the the sunset that like that this is somehow not a I don't I don't know how else to describe it. Like well, I suppose artists reference art references the current gen well generally speaking, it references the, the, the world we're in now. Mm -hmm. And so this is doing exactly what art should do. It is referencing the now. And this is the now, you know, we've, we've, the world has shifted so much from, you know, a couple of hundred years ago. And plus also, I suppose, when you go back to a long time ago, people couldn't afford to buy art. You know, right. we live in a world now where we can afford to. Um, whereas once only the church, for instance, could buy the art or, or exceptionally wealthy industrialists or something, you know, could, could purchase the art. But, but now this gives everyone an opportunity to buy something because the prices are brought down in some of these. And again, like you said, you can, buying a collectible, you can still buy an edition, you know, a small edition of something that was meant to be, you know, put out there as mass manufactured, sell as many as you want. And it's going against that still anyway. Sure. I mean, there's there's certainly been a, a democratization of, of the process, especially in, in this, you know, quote unquote bootleg toy movement, because people are figuring out how to do it themselves. and. And I guess way back when, if you were going to be a painter, like you would, you know, you didn't go to school. You had to, yeah, you had to apprentice to someone. And if you were going to paint a painting, you know, it took months, you know, how many paintings could you produce in a year? And then of course you're selling it for a lot of money to wealthy people. Yeah, totally. But, you know, the idea that someone can make, I mean, how long do these take them to make approximately? 
they take due to the process of drying and all that stuff they probably take probably about two days each but what I do is obviously work on a series of them sure sort of from piece to piece because I generally paint all the pieces first or the sides and stuff before I join them because they're joined they're glued down and clamped and then nailed into place and hole punched and re-bogged and sanded back and so it's quite a quite a process but yeah it'd probably be a day to two if I could just work solidly on one piece depending on the complexities as well you know and taping up and so is is the wood baked no, that's um, that's an FSC certified, so it is somewhat as environmentally friendly as we can get these days. Um, so mm -hmm. it's a pine. I don't. I did throw around the idea of using really nice timbers initially, mm -hmm. but I thought, well, there's no use using a really beautiful hard Australian hardwood, and right. then you just paint over the top of it. So what's the sure. point of no, that? No, but so, but it, there is a process of like baking wood in order to get the moisture out, so it doesn't crack over time. Uh, well, no, it shouldn't in theory. This is this timber is what they'll use on a house, for instance. I see. Um, it's not, so, yeah, it's, it's heavy duty timber. It's not a timber from an art store, say, for instance. Or it's got like it. That. So it, yeah. it's something that, that's already sort of like dried. Totally, yeah. Milled, dried. Got it. Because, yeah, I've seen that like just in the toy world in general, like <laughs> people, people would make toys out of wood. And like you can think of all the wood toys that you had as a kid, wood blocks. Yep. And all of that stuff like has gone through some sort of like baking process in order to heat it and get the moisture out. And then if not, eventually it's like, you know, some of the water like evaporates out of there and sometimes you get a crack. Yep. But, you know, that, that never happens to like, you know, those block, those kids blocks or those, those shapes, you know, with the, yep. the, you know, that kind of stuff. Wow. So. So this is just a phase in many phases that you have. Uh, do you foresee yourself continuing this for a long time? Like, or is I do, this? I, I definitely do for a while. I'm also doing a lot of reliefs now that are based uh -huh. on that same minimalism and shape, you know, like brutalist shapes and, um, you know, Memphis. I, I'm inspired by a lot of, you know, architecture and, and design. Mm -hmm. So I've kind of moved into some of these being... Yeah, more relief based. I'll just I'll grab one and show you so you can see what I mean. I, re I remember that the Astro Boy, yeah, that one, and you showed me the picture of the land speeder. Oh, look at that. That's like a sl slate one, obviously. Right. Um, so that's kind of a layered um, piece. Wow. So I've moved into doing a lot of those as well. And yeah, and I have the land speeder, of course, as well. As one does. Yes, of course. Um, you know, but some of these I just keep for myself um, and hang them, you know, privately in my own collection. But sometimes, you know, after a few years, I'll be like, ah, oh, maybe I can let it go now. You know, you get attached to some of the pieces. You know, like the, the Charlie Brown um, that I gave you, I was very attached to that. And mm -hmm. my partner didn't want me to send that off to you. And I was like, no, nah, we've had it here for a while now. I know I said it was ours, but I'm going to shift it on, keep going. Yeah. But you have another one behind you. I do, but that one, that one actually, I had a bit of an issue. I probably can't see it. When I glued it down, I had a little bit of movement. Um, so we've got a bit of a glue stain. So, mm. so that's not going anywhere. So you keep the oh, reject for yourself. Totally, yeah. So and I, I will paint a couple of eyes on it, but yeah, that'll just be mine in the back. It's a little bit, you can only just notice it, but it's enough because it's on the, you know, the facade, the head there, it's not you know up. it's not good enough to ship out that's for sure wow so uh so like i was saying you, you've gone through these phases like is this is this like your thing like is this going to be it you're going to be making these for generations I, I, to come or you think I, you're gonna you'll shift into something else i think i will still be doing it but i've got some plans on different ideas and you know bringing this into larger scale sculpture Mm -hmm. So I think I'll be doing this for a long time, to be honest. But it will obviously change as time as time goes on, somewhat, and find new form, I suppose, um, new so, uses. So you you foresee you doing life size walrus men or ones would, like as I big? I would love to. I would absolutely love to. <laughs> that would be insane. Yeah, totally. <laughs> that I mean, would I, just we, we have like a we have a freeway here, 
in Australia and the government paid, or in Melbourne, Victoria, um, and the government paid for all these sculptors to do these huge sculptors. And my dream is when I was young, we had this character called Humphrey B. Bear, who was this bear dude who jumped around, never spoke and blah, 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 with a tartan vest on. And, and I would love to one day do a gigantic Humphrey B. Bear, like along, the, along this freeway somewhere. I think it would just totally tall and most Australians would be like oh my god it's Humphrey B. Bear that's insane <laughs> how tall how tall would that have to be in order for um, people in a, in a moving car that fast to see it I would like to do it at least 10 meters high ideally some of the sculptures they have on this freeway because it's a fairly big freeway not in comparison to LA's freeways ours sure half the size but but yeah a lot of the sculptures are huge they're you know a couple of stories high and stuff so I'd like something like that I think that's that amazing but anyway, one one day hopefully that's my dream. Well, one day yeah, I hope to I I hope to travel to Australia and be able to drive on a freeway and see that. That would be. Yeah. If, when I first actually saw it, they someone set up a hotel on there, and I thought it was a legit hotel, and they'd be, built this five story type hotel, but it was all just one color. And I was like, wow, that's weird. And my partner then said to me, it's a it's part of the art installation. It's not a real it's not a real hotel. I was like, oh my god. Um, so there's really weird stuff. There's, you know, some modern Memphis stuff all along there. And there's actually a giant silver gnome at one point as well, like garden gnome, chrome type. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. And everyone knows that too. You say about the gnome, I was like, yeah, I know the gnome. I know the gnome. Where you exit on the, you know, off to Frankston or something. Well, that's where it used to be. I think some of them, they move around at times as well. They share the love. of the <laughs> Wow. That's amazing. Well, sir, thank you so much for taking the time. Um, Thank you so much for making all of these beautiful pieces. I think we've sold close to half of them already. Um, for anyone watching, there's still a bunch of them on the site. They're just uh, just phenomenal. We just sold the, the Skeletor just I don't know, an hour I ago. Yeah, I've so, done, I think that's the third. When, when I, I do occasionally make the same sculpture again, but I make them different, so they're never the same. Essentially, because I can make all of them, they are never the same, even in a series, there is slight differentiations. Mm -hmm. But I do when I make an, another, you know, edition of one, um, which most of them are, of course, I do change them somewhat. So the other two skeletals out there in existence, which are over in the States anyway, most of my work sells overseas. I hardly sell anything in Australia. There's not a huge market here for, this is a little bit, because we're a bit backward, this is a little bit far ahead maybe in 10 years it'll start really picking up here um but yeah it all goes overseas so i've just picked up a contract i think i was telling you with um with a gallery in hong kong and beijing so i'm hoping they're doing an edition of a astro boy so i'm hoping breaking into that market because obviously that sounds, a huge that, market. Sound, that sounds amazing uh, ian just pulled up a, a photo on the computer here of this huge silver garden dome <laughs> Yeah, you've got it. <laughs> yeah. That's uh, the one. It's a yeah. beauty. Oh, someone posted it here in the chat. Oh, Marco posted it. So if anyone click on that link that's there, that's uh, phenomenal. Wow. Um, so let me ask you another question because uh, someone asked before, just before we go. Um, so when you do make an addition like the Homer, does that mean you're making them all at once? Yes, I'd make them all at once. Yeah. You make them all at once. And then when the other pieces that you just make one at a time, um, they're one-offs because the next one you make could be, because I noticed that this Walrus Man is very different from the one that you made me. Totally. You, yeah, you know, the year, the year before, it's like, yeah. it's got a glue, the face is different. Like, it's just a lot of details that are, proportions that probably, are different. That one's probably reduced more as well from the one I did for you. That's probably mm -hmm. even minimized even more. Because I think I did with his little mouth, I think I used from memory two circles for the mouth on your one. Mm. You, do you want to hand me that one just so I can show people? Um, so when is it, re is the goal to reduce it? It, it as, is a lot of the time. As much as possible? I do a lot of the time. Sometimes I love the certain details in the character that I, I keep them like, you know, mm -hmm. the, SpongeBob, for instance, is not reduced that much because I just love certain aspects of it. So I just didn't want to pull it back too much. I didn't want to give it the one eye. I wanted two eyes because he's got those huge bulbous eyes. Mm. Uh, well, here you can see. I'm cool with the 
Oh, there we go. Yeah, exactly. There we go. And yeah, and the top's rounded and yeah. I mean, th this is, um, well, yeah, look, the top is rounded. The hands are different. Yeah, it's slightly different paint job. I see. So you're just kind of sort of reinterpreting. Yeah. So when, when, so are you generally trying to get, I, I guess now that you're talking about it, I see that some are reduced more than others. Definitely. Yeah. Like Ch Charlie Brown with his head, his head shape and the hair is not reduced as much as let's say Barney yeah, or, Sco or, or Scooby-Doo. Yeah. Except for Big Bird. I mean, Big Bird is completely reduced besides besides the legs, which is that's something I really love about the Big Bird because it is so completely reduced. But you mm -hmm. see those legs and that's completely recognizable. Right. Hold on. And this one is just so incredibly huge. Yeah, it's a, it's a beauty, isn't it? <laughs> it's like 14, 15 inches tall. It's insane, but look at the legs are just and that's like Big Bird. See, that's the that's the interesting thing about you know like marketing and branding. How powerful you know psychologically it is on us that you can literally take such a tiny little colorway and just mm -hmm. add it, to, and, and it's recognizable. You know, like Mickey Mouse is so amazing at that. You could you could literally get one of the, a block of wood and paint it for three colors and just right. put it. There. And I reckon people would a lot of people would get it. They'd be like, oh, they'd think Mickey Mouse straight away. Right, right. Oh, now that you mentioned Mickey Mouse, that's how I met you. Oh, that, was too, I, that, you got a, that's what I bought a Mickey Mouse for my wife. Yeah, you did from Sweden. Something know. like that. Yes, that yeah. Mickey Mouse is that's insane. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I have one. I have one here. I just I did a show for. A, um, oh yeah, everyone juvenile. should see it. This was this is the piece that like I had the aha moment. That this is unfortunately this got broken in a show, but. Um, the ears sort of sit on top and inside, but can you hold it up a little bit? There, you, yeah. And it's just yeah. that same that same hunk of wood with the one ear, and, and it was like there as well. Oh, this has two ears, right? So it kind of also represented a bit of a film camera. I did it as as well. Right. So yeah, that was the piece. I that's the one that I saw that I just I instantly just boom I I got it like it. It connected and then so had you done star wars before i contacted you uh yeah i think i'm just trying to think when you con i think you contacted me before before my oh i'm not sure actually no that's a good that's a good question i think i had because you did a darth vader i have a darth vader up there yeah. and chewbacca and a boba fett yeah, I'm sure I had done some, but my when I, when I did that first initial show, even though I've been making it for a few years before I did a show solely on false idols, mm -hmm. um, a lot of those were those characters from. They were probably even some of them '60s characters, '60s and early '70s characters, mm -hmm. um, which were really focused on my childhood, heavily focused, or you know things from you know Dr. Seuss characters from books, and you know a lot of Motu as well. But yeah, I would have definitely had. I did because I had some. I had a. I think I had a layer and a Boba Fett and a Chewbacca or something like that in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, Chewbacca is fantastic. Yeah. Let me, looks, let me just bo jaws. before we go. Let me just show that. Can you just grab the Chewbacca off the shelf because it's. Um, have you got your Have you got your Chewbacca in there or something, Doug? Yeah, Ian's grabbing it right now. I have all of like this work area with all of these projects on it, but for some reason your stuff is just sitting in the middle of all that. And it's like there he is. And he's a decent size one too, the two parts. Yeah. Which so he deserves to be, you know, big and wholesome and in your face. <laughs> the bandolier. <laughs> Fantastic. All right, sir. I, Thank I, I must say I love them myself. Like there's something about I do, like I said, I do get attached, as you can see behind me. There's a few up on the shelf. I just can't let go of some of them. I, you know, I think a lot of artists like that probably anyway. There's things that you do and you're like, I just can't, I have to hold on to that for a while. I can't shift and let it go out into the world. But <laughs> I guess that that's interesting because you know, I've had this conversation over the weekend with a lot of artists, and there, there's some that you know look back at their work. And um, oh, Ian's now playing with all of your toys. 
Uh, there's, 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 there's people who look back at their work and are horrified by it. And yeah, oh, got the... I had to do the launching saber, you know, obviously. Yeah, of, of course. Day, the Return of the Jedi. Skip exactly. saying. <laughs> oh, see, that's like, oh, you know what happened there? I saw that one's got a different signature on it, Dove. Because Let's I did see. something really stupid when I was making that because I, I can't get my stamp in with legs, so I have to go on this system. Oh, so you and had to write you had to write I it joined, by hand. I joined the yeah, the, and I couldn't get my stamp, and I was like, oh my god, what have I done? So I was like, well, he gets a very special edition. So. <laughs> <laughs> the special edition. Yeah, that's right. Totally. Special yeah. signature. Yeah. So you know, we've talked to artists this weekend who, you know, after they make their work don't really enjoy looking at it again and sort of have moved on and okay. don't take any pleasure from it. And there's another group that, you know, continue to be inspired by what they've made and to the point where there are some that even don't want to sell them and don't want to let them go. I mean, I'm sure you've yep. met artists like that. It's like, you know, you could make more money if you'd actually sell something. And they're like, oh, I like, they're my children. I can't part with them. It's like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> some people are like, no, I made it and I have to let it go. And they're, yeah. Yeah, so I'm caught in that world a bit. And that's also, when, you, when you're working, I find like working on series or, you know, shows, whatever, to be surrounded with it, mm -hmm. keeps you in that mindset, you know, to sure. separate yourself from everything. It, it keeps you where you're going, you know, because you don't want to shift halfway through a, you know, you're working on a body of work and then you start shifting through it. You need to get that out, you know, and finish right. it up and be done with it as well. I, I mean, I guess like a lot of these bootleg toy makers like the conversations i have with them and i tell them all of them to make an artist proof or two of everything they make and keep it um because i've just seen because what happens invariably is people think like oh i made this so i could make it again but they'll never make it again and then the brown paint that like they use is no longer available or the what they use to print it, the technology has slightly changed and it's never the same and you never have the time to go back and make it. Yeah. And it just, it <laughs> the what? Like feel you feel attacked? Oh yeah, Ian is <laughs> notorious, all the toys that he makes and he doesn't even keep one for himself. And then, yeah, it's like, what, what if you had to like go back on eBay and try and buy your own thing back? Like it just, um, I mean, for several reasons, for archive reasons, to take photos of for you know promotion later. And then obviously like if you're working something and working in an art career, if this is you know 350 now, one day, you know, hopefully it's 10 times that, you know, that's the goal, or a hundred times that. And then to not be able to have, you know, one to put in a retrospective or one just to sell to capitalize on, you know. You know, because because uh, artists are always selling, and that's this interesting, you know, thing about these NFTs these days, um, is that artists are always selling their work at market value and don't really get to benefit from sales in the future. Uh, California here tried to pass a law that said if you're a California artist and you sold a piece of California art in California, so it's a little like hokey to start with. Yep. Um, over a certain amount, the artist was entitled to 1% back. And then ultimately the California Supreme Court struck that down and said that was not constitutional because it violated some, you, you can, people can go look it up. It, it violated some rule of like first ownership that, you know, it's like if, if you have a legal contract where I pay you money and you give me something, that thing belongs to that person. And to say that you still own a piece of that is, but then apparently someone told me there's rules about destroying art. So you can buy it, but the people who destroyed that Banksy piece of art to create that uh, NFT, um, that that's illegal. And it's considered some sort of price fixing in order to like destroy art to increase the value. Like, yeah, yep. So I guess you, you're, artists are not allowed to profit from it, but the per person can't destroy it either, not intentionally, I, whatever. Yeah. You could imagine the can of worms if, if you brought something like I'm, I'm not saying that that's a bad thing for artists to profit ongoing into the future, but you could that could come into play with everything. You know, you buy a car and years later, next thing Holden want part of right. the profit for selling it. You know, like it could get pretty loose. And I don't know. 
you know, you, I mean, you sell, I, I, we sell a product essentially in the end, you know, that's part of us, whatever, but we sell it and that person owns it. You got to let go of it. I think. I mean, I think it's complete bullshit that like when I'm using some software and then I have to sign something saying that that software is not mine yeah. and that, you know, they're, they're leasing it to me, you know, cause they're afraid that if it's mine, I could take it and copy it and change it, mm-hmm. you know? And so then, you know, those people who had that electric car back in the day, you know, that first electric car, what was it called? The one that they did the documentary about when they destroyed them all. Like no one actually owned that car. They were only leased. And then eventually the company decided to scrap them all. You know, it was just like yeah. people were up in arms. Um, all right, sir. Sorry, I'm rambling on. No, that's fine. On, on a hey, tangent. Thank you so much. Everyone. No, thank you, man. I just the, the work is 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 inspiring. Uh, I look at it and just especially all of it in a row here. I just you can just see with the people buying it when it kind of like converts. They sort of like get it, and then it it's just uh, I don't know. I I think there's a point at which like you look at the work and you're trying to figure it out and what it is and you get the character, but then you see like the body of work and then somehow it clicks. Have you had this experience? It clicks and then people are like, oh yeah, I get it. And then they want to own one. Totally. Some, some people send me messages that they like, they don't read any of the posts and they're like, I just look at them because I want to work out what the character is. It's like this game involved in first right. what it is, you know, and I probably shouldn't write names down. I should probably just leave it as false and let people work it out for themselves. So, you know, <laughs> another element into it but, indeed you know, I, I love making up names from like you know the angry wookie you know, <laughs> you know some of them are quirky it's like that's cool when i think of them like angry wookie how good's that like you know with his big mouth ah, you know amazing all right sir <laughs> thank thank you again i really appreciate it Thanks, guys. and it's really nice to finally talk to you in person dog pleasure and we shall speak soon thanks for having we me on. definitely will take care Goodbye. man thank you again bye-bye yeah bye